thank you very much and happy Friday uh, to everyone, uh, wherever you're joining from. I'm very, very pleased that you could uh, participate again today. And uh, you're right, Merle, the timing of today's topic is impeccable, dare I say, uh, the economy and the environment. Uh, I wish I could claim I had planned it this way, uh, but it was just sheer luck uh, that our course outline uh, got to the environment section at the very moment that all the leaders uh, are meeting uh, over in uh, in Glasgow. So that will be uh, that will be really, uh, I think, uh, fitting. And uh, I look forward to our discussion. Uh, I also just want to add my thanks uh, to Merle's for the folks who donated to the week of giving from uh, the uh, uh, Later Life Learning and Innes College. Uh, they do such fabulous work there and I'm uh, really grateful for your uh, support. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna quickly uh, call up my uh, slides here. Stand by for one moment. Uh, a couple of uh, sort of uh, housekeeping-ish uh, kind of things or just uh, update things. Uh, last week, when we were talking about uh, reproduction in the economic sense of the word, the boring economic sense of the word, and income distribution and power differentials in the economy, um, we had some questions for some uh, additional materials, and I promised to put them up on that website uh, that we've got for the course as part of uh, our centerforfuturework.ca uh, website. So here uh, is just showing you where they're up there. That included, uh, someone asked about who are some feminist economists uh, to read. So there's a, a short uh, a short list of uh, a few and a summary of uh, what they did. Uh, someone asked, because uh, we got rushed uh, at the end uh, for a bit more information on universal basic income and the ideas uh, behind that. Uh, so there's some references there. And then uh, also we were talking about the uh, Gini coefficient as a way of uh, measuring inequality. And I described it in words, but uh, argued that there would be a, a, an easier approach if you actually saw the picture. In fact, I'm gonna show this to you because uh, I, I remember actually when I first learned about the Gini coefficient, I just thought it was one of the coolest things going. I do have a, a nerdy streak to my pers personality, but if you're into geometry, at all this is uh, this is a picture of how the gini coefficient works you remember we organized the whole population from left to right along the bottom of this graph from the poorest on the left to the richest uh, on the right and that isn't necessarily uh, because poor people vote for the left and rich people vote for the right although there is an element of that then uh, along the vertical axis going up and down is their share, their cumulative share of how much income was received. So if you started at the left and had the poorest, say 1% of the population, if they got 1% of the income, that is everything was equal, and then the 2% two the poorest 2% got 2% and so on and so forth, you'd have that 45 degree line going across. And that's the, uh, the line of equality. But in reality, poor people have less than their share of income. So the graph that curved line in the middle, which is called the Lorenz curve, uh, rises more slowly than 45 degrees. But then rich people have more than their share, and that's how it catches up uh, to the 45 degree axis uh, at the end. And the Gini coefficient is the ratio of the area, that pink area, A, to the combined area under the 45 degree line. And uh, this is why if you had perfect equality, everyone had exactly the same share, the Gini ratio would be zero. If you had perfect inequality, so that only the richest person at the end, who's the richest uh, Canadian now? I think it's still uh, Ken Thompson, the uh, patriarch of the Thompson uh, publishing empire. Uh, then if he had everything, then uh, it would be a flat line across and then shooting right up to 100%. So then the Gini coefficient would be one because that pink area would take up the whole uh, triangle. So anyways, I don't know. I, I, I'm a bit of a sicko on the graphs and the geometry and all that, but uh, there we go. Uh, okay, another uh, another just uh, kind of retro uh, snap back to something that we talked about earlier. Remember, we talked about labor markets and the minimum wage, and I pointed out that an Ontario-born economist, uh, David Card, had just won the Nobel Prize for his work showing the minimum wage did not destroy jobs, as is often argued in the traditional free market world, and uh, in fact had lots of uh, benefits. And I highlighted that uh, our Ontario Premier should have read David Card. Well, somewhere between that lecture and this week, Premier Doug Ford 
must have gone out and read David Card's Nobel Prize winning work on the benefits of higher minimum wages because surprise, surprise, he showed up uh, with two union leaders behind him of all people uh, to announce an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, we'd already had one increase this year, uh, uh, according to their plan. It was all of 10 cents from 1425 to 1435. But uh, now he's come out and uh, uh, said, nope, that's not enough, uh, changed his mind. He originally canceled the plan to increase the minimum wage to $15 when he was first uh, came to office. In fact, it was about the first thing the government did was cancel that. But now uh, I think he's read the uh, political writing on the wall because there's an election in Ontario in a few months and uh, he's trying to position himself now as a friend of workers. Uh, so you know what, I'll take it any way we can get it, uh, whatever the motives are. And the fact that it is politically popular tells you something. It means that most people in society work for a living as we have argued through this course and will benefit from higher minimum wages. The employers by and large don't like it, but uh, we do to some extent live in a democracy. So uh, this is where I think uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that we can change economic discourse over time. It isn't set in stone. And there's a close relationship between economics and politics. So those are things that we've argued throughout this course. And I think this story was a good example uh, of that. So uh, congratulations to all the low wage workers in Ontario who are gonna get a 5% raise uh, when the minimum wage goes up. So that will be well, uh, well appreciated. Okay, uh, economics for everyone. Uh, here we are with a few photos from the COP uh, uh, climate change uh, conference uh, in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, there's uh, our prime minister uh, who went over um, and uh, there's all the protesters outside trying to push the politicians to make something uh, real out of it. Um, uh, Merle, you indicated at the beginning that Canada has one of the 10 best uh, climate reputations uh, in the world. Not 100% sure that's deserved. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of uh, Canada's experience uh, around uh, climate and the environment uh, as we go forward. But certainly good to see that the, the government uh, is, um, uh, is uh, making some commitments over there, some new announcements uh, that were made, including around capping emissions from the oil and gas sector, uh, deforestation. Uh, and uh, and some other measures. Uh, so let's talk about how all that fits together and how do we think of the environment and the economy uh, relating together. Uh, the key concepts that we will cover today, we're gonna talk about how the economy depends on nature, how it does depend on the uh, environment. Uh, we're gonna talk about how the environment affects human the human condition, uh, human living standards. Uh, we're gonna introduce the concept of sustainability uh, we'll talk about uh, some related concepts like environmental inequality. Why do poor people seem to suffer the worst of uh, the environmental damage that's being done? Uh, we'll talk about markets and prices and the extent to which they can uh, contribute uh, to uh, sustainability or are they the problem? And then we'll also talk about growth, economic growth, and whether uh, that is the problem and whether climate change means we can't have economic growth. Uh, there's a few of the terms that are uh, listed in the online glossary, which is also posted on that same page uh, on our website and also at economicsforeveryone.ca. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this whole uh, problem of uh, climate change is just uh, obviously a whole new dimension of uh, the environmental uh, constraints on economic activity. Um, there have always been environmental side effects to the work that we do. And uh, gradually, uh, I think humans have learned how to appreciate the links between the environment and the economy better and do what's required. Uh, uh, but the climate change challenge is, is uh, just a different order of magnitude for various reasons. It's global in nature uh, because of uh, it's, it's driven, climate change is driven by the global accumulation of uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, in the atmosphere, it isn't limited to any one country. No one country caused it. No one country can solve it. So uh, that creates a governance problem. Uh, it's also just uh, enormously important. Uh, we've had lots of environmental problems in the past, but none that threaten our well-being to the extent that uh, that climate change does. Um, I think uh, most uh, most folks uh, joining us today are going to uh, be familiar with the, what's happening. Uh, because of the release of uh, carbon dioxide and other gases which have a similar effect like methane from economic activity, mostly from burning fossil fuels for energy. That's by far the biggest source of uh, these uh, pollutants, but it's not the only source. It comes from other, other things as well, including chemical processes, uh, including agriculture, cows. They go out and eat and they fart, and that actually produces a lot of methane. 
So uh, these are things uh, that also contribute, but a dominant uh, cause of uh, growing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. This graph shows the, the rise in CO2 measured uh, over Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, steady over the uh, last uh, 60 years. Uh, the the uh, squiggly up and down is the month to month data. So there's a strong seasonal component to it, but the black line shows the annual trend. And uh, we used to think that um, we should try to limit CO2 co uh, uh, concentration to 350 parts per million. Uh, we're way, way, way past that. In fact, there's a global environmental group called 350.org uh, that was named after that point as being a, a key benchmark. Um, and we're way past that. And uh, the problem is even if we stopped adding those pollutants right now, the concentration itself would remain very, very high. Uh, you know, even if we stopped all that pollution, at least it wouldn't be getting worse, but the concentration is already high enough to be causing climate change and that's uh, part of our problem. So um, there's still a handful of people, mostly uh, people who directly or indirectly are paid by the fossil fuel industry who are trying to claim that this is not happening or that it's, uh, you know, some kind of global um, geophysical phenomena not related to human activity. That's just nonsense. Uh, it is clear that um, uh, global temperatures are already rising. Uh, this shows uh, the monthly global average relative to the long run period. And uh, it's, it's already up by um, the better part of a degree uh, Celsius. And the, uh, the work around uh, the Paris Accord and the other international agreements that are trying to limit pollution that they're talking about in Glasgow is aimed at trying to limit the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which would still be a huge problem. Even with where it's happened, we've already got evidence about some of the consequences. 1.5 degrees would be a huge problem, and that's in question whether we can limit it to 1.5 degrees, uh, or is it gonna be an even bigger, uh, a bigger one? So um, we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change. This isn't a hypothetical uh, situation. We're seeing more uh, severe weather. Uh, both floods and droughts, uh, rising sea levels uh, could be uh, perhaps the most uh, dangerous uh, problem here in the uh, in the long run. And uh, if in fact we don't keep the uh, rise in temperature, then we're going to see much worse consequences. Um, one of the ones I think about a lot is just the human displacement, particularly in developing countries. If you've ever visited a place like India or Bangladesh or Indonesia, um, uh, uh, you see millions and millions and millions of people living in uh, very marginal conditions right next to the ocean. And those are people whose uh, uh, lives are going to be destroyed by uh, rising sea levels. And uh, I'm influenced, I think, about the uh, civil war in Syria, the horrible things that happened there and the huge outflow of people from Syria. About five million uh, refugees left Syria. Most of them were left in Turkey and Jordan. Those are the two places that got most of them. But, you know, hundreds of thousands came to other places, including something like 40,000 to Canada. And just think about what a, uh, an impact that flow of humans had on all kinds of things, including politics in Europe and America and elsewhere because of the, uh, you know, some of the kind of anti-immigrant sentiment that got going uh, with all that. Now multiply that times at least 100 to 500 million, and you're talking about the scale of migration that would be required from uh, rising sea levels. And uh, this is just uh, going to be an enormous, uh, enormous challenge. Uh, this is where, again, Canada's reputation that Merle mentioned at the beginning may not be deserved. This uh, shows uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, measured in tons per person uh, in Canada. And, uh, you know, I remember I, I mentioned last time we like to pat ourselves on the back for being better than the Americans. <laughs> well, we can sort of do that if you squint and look carefully at that graph. Uh, we are slightly better than the Americans, although uh, American emissions have fallen quite a bit in the last uh, decade, mostly because um, some of their coal-fired electricity plants have been shut down, not because of environmental motives, mostly because of cost. But it, again, we'll take it any way we can get it. So uh, Canada is uh, among the absolute worst uh, industrial countries in the world in terms of how much we emit per person. And uh, despite all of the, you know, good intentions and some good policies that have been implemented over the last decade, our emissions as a country, our aggregate emissions have hardly fallen at all. And uh, that's, a, that's a big problem because the scale of action that uh, people are suggesting is needed is going to be uh, 
to reduce our emissions. We're already committed to reducing our emissions below 2005 levels under the Paris Agreement by around 30 percent. But we've made more uh, ambitious commitments now to what's called net zero by 2050, which means we basically have to get our net emissions to zero. Um, and we're a long ways away from even heading that way. Interesting to note the big differences in emissions across countries. So you've got Australia as the worst industrial country at the top. You've got Sweden, the best uh, industrial country at the bottom. Sweden has a very high material standard of living. People are very prosperous. It ranks higher than Canada on the human development index that we looked at at the beginning of this class. And yet they produce one quarter as much greenhouse gas emissions per person. So the idea that we have to do this, uh, we have to burn fossil fuel in order to have a high standard of living, likewise, fake news, not remotely true. Uh, we can have a high standard of living, we can be employed, we can have high incomes, we can have lots of material goods and services to consume, but uh, we can do it in different ways if we put our minds to it and regulate how the economy uh, functions. And um, there's ample evidence around the world that it's possible and the argument that we would have to sacrifice our standard of living to do that is is not supported at all uh, on the other hand as we imagine how to um, uh, tackle the problem of climate change and other environmental problems but especially climate change uh, there's always this uh, balancing act that we encounter this challenge of, uh, how do we how do we protect the environment but also protect our employment our income our standard of living uh, is it possible uh, to do both? And I say the answer is yes. But uh, this argument that there is an inherent trade-off between your job and the climate uh, is very powerful still. And you see it in, in Canadian debates. It's not as powerful as it used to be. Um, and uh, a good example of that was the change in tone over these discussions that was evident in the 2021 federal election that we had a couple of months ago. Um, the uh, even you know, even forces in, in politics that traditionally would have downplayed the importance of uh, limiting uh, climate change and reducing our emissions have been forced by both scientific uh, reality and political reality to say, no, that argument just doesn't wash anymore. You still see it in the pages of the National Post and a few other uh, outlets and press releases from the Alberta government's funded war room. The war room in Alberta is a government funded office that costs about 25 million dollars a year to basically put out propaganda denying that climate change is a problem and denying that fossil fuels have anything to do with it it's just uh, utterly lamentable that the alberta government wastes money on that so you still hear these arguments but they're losing uh, and for for good reason okay let's talk about uh, the economy and the environment and how they fit together now this is something you may have seen once or twice or perhaps 10 times so far in this class uh, the economy is the sum total of our work and it matters here too. Uh, what we do is we take our brains and our brawn, our capacity to move things and solve problems, and then we apply it to the resources that we harvest uh, from nature, the so-called free gifts of nature. And then we use them to produce uh, useful goods and services, to transform what we take from nature into the goods and services that we can use. And as we discussed, every job, including massage therapists, uh, depends on uh, tools and equipment and uh, supplies. And those things all came from nature. So every job that we do involves uh, harvesting things from nature and uh, transforming them through our work into useful goods and services. So now, um, you know, that was, this was always true, but because of climate change, we've got to zero in on the nature part of this equation and think about how do we manage uh, the economy and our work in a way that uh, does not do uh, irreversible damage and intolerable consequences uh, from uh, environmental uh, challenges. Uh, so all production uh, involves uh, doing something with nature. What are the things that we get from nature? Well, I kind of put them into three broad buckets. Uh, the first one uh, has a sort of highfalutin term called ecological benefits, by which I'm referring to the kind of inherent goods, the, the inherent uh, pleasure, the inherent livelihood that we get, that thanks to the land uh, we live on, the air we breathe, and the water that we drink. Uh, we have to have uh, a tolerable natural environment in, in which to live and work, no doubt about it. Secondly, uh, are the natural resources or materials that we actually extract from nature as an input to our work. So this includes uh, food that we grow in the agriculture industry, uh, forestry, wood, uh, minerals that we extract from the ground, water, um, uh, fish that we uh, harvest, 
um, and anything else that we get from nature as raw material that's uh, used one way or another in every single industry that we uh, do. Then the third interaction is uh, using the environment as a dump, basically, or a sink for the pollution that is produced as a byproduct of our uh, production and our uh, consumption. So uh, I've got a, just a very kind of simple diagram that is um, that is covered in the uh, in the chapter 16 of the book, which is our, our reading for this week, um, that I'll just kind of run over. Now we have, uh, in the book, I, I developed this uh, map of the economy on a step-by-step -step basis. And I haven't I haven't gone through that in detail uh, in this course, uh, mostly because of uh, time constraints. Um, but uh, what we do is we've drawn a simple picture of how the basic uh, activities of the economy, including uh, work, income generation, production, uh, consumption and reproduction in workers' homes at the bottom of the picture, and then the extraction of profit by the 2%, the 2% of the population who own most business wealth um, at the top. So. Just think of this, we don't need to go through the details of this right now, but just think of this as a simple flow chart that describes the key things happening in a, uh, in a capitalist economy like the one we live in. Now we have to embed this economy in the natural environment. So that's what we've done. We've said this is an economy that doesn't just float in outer space. It's an economy that's based on a planet with uh, environmental wealth, but also environmental limits. And so the different ways that we capture those interactions that I just talked about, uh, number one is those so-called ecological benefits, the, the idea that we have to have uh, a place to live and work and, and the basics uh, of life. Uh, there are the natural resources that we harvest from nature as an input to all forms of production. So uh, I have described this as a flow of uh, goods and materials uh, from nature into the, into the process of work. So going to the workplace there. And then the third is the uh, use of the natural environment as a sink uh, or a dump uh, for the pollution that's produced in the course of uh, that. Now, in this simple graph, I've described all the pollution as coming from the process of production, and a lot of it, a lot of it does: air pollution, water pollution, uh, waste, uh, and so on. Uh, pollution can also come from the act of consuming things. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you get in your car and, and drive around with your family on Sunday to take a trip, that's a a form of consumption and you're polluting. Uh, if you're not driving an electric vehicle, you're you're adding to the pollution. So uh, in reality, it can also come from the households down there as well as from, uh, excuse me, the households at the bottom and the household at the top, uh, as well as from the production process. In fact, a disproportionate share of it comes from the household at the top. This is one dimension of uh, environmental inequality. Uh, the the both the amount of consumption that uh, wealthy people are able to undertake and the nature of it uh, tend to be quite um, pollution intensive. Uh, they take a lot of uh, flights, uh, drive larger cars, uh, have bigger homes to heat. Uh, they obviously produce more than their share. Canada produces more than our share, but within Canada, rich people produce even more than more than their share. Uh, okay, so that's just a kind of simple depiction of these three different forms of interaction between the economy and the environment. Uh, let's consider the concept of sustainability. Uh, sustainability, in the common sense uh, of the word, simply means something you can keep doing, and that's exactly what we're getting at here. Uh, in terms of uh, environmental sustainability, we're talking about how do we manage those three interactions, those three types of interactions between the economy and the environment, in a way that it can keep going. Okay, so that uh, we don't run out of stuff that we need from nature and we haven't damaged nature so much that we can't uh, harvest those ecological benefits, we can't live and work, and we can't add more pollution to it. Uh, sooner or later, we are gonna encounter uh, limits, uh, potentially on all three of those things. And so what we have to do is find a way to manage our work in the environment, the way that we work, the way we pollute, the way we harvest raw materials so that we do not undermine the quality of those ecological benefits. We aren't held back by a lack of ability to extract those natural resources. You know, in the simplest sense, we don't run out of the things we need from nature. Now that's a simple way of putting it and it actually doesn't really happen that way. It's very rare that we actually run out of stuff from nature. But what happens is the, the quality or the availability or the cost of it um, uh, dim diminishes. And then, of course, the environment's ability to uh, absorb pollution. The economy, the, sorry, the planet can accept a certain amount of uh, CO2 pollution for the obvious reason that uh, some things happen to CO2 uh, in the environment. Uh, 
particularly trees, uh, absorb CO2 and emit oxygen. So there's a certain amount of pollution that can occur, and that's true of other kinds of pollution as well, thanks to the ability of nature to absorb and cleanse those. But uh, we've obviously surpassed that. We're obviously stressing the capacity of the environment to absorb those things much more than it can. And ultimately, I think uh, we are going to have to uh, address the, the, the challenges to our work and our standard of living, and in fact, our ability to live uh, from the degradation uh, of those things. Um, environmental inequality is, I think, a really important dimension of it all. Uh, and this is why, you know, my question, are we all in this together, is a genuine question. Uh, I'm not sure that we're all in this together, and it is certainly the case that um, people who are well off are less affected and are better able to protect themselves from uh, the impact of environmental degradation. You know, I mentioned the people who are probably most vulnerable to climate change uh, are the people who live near the sea in uh, poor countries around the world, especially island uh, nations, of course. There are entire countries that could disappear, like the Maldives and uh, some of the countries in Micronesia area and so on. Um, so uh, uh, poor people there and poor people here uh, experience more of the harm of environmental degradation, even though they contributed less to the problem. Uh, it's especially, you know, unfair in a north-south sense uh, of the world. Most of the CO2 that's in the air today was emitted by industrial countries who've been pumping it out for centuries since the invention of the steam engine and the widespread use of coal as an energy source and then other fossil fuels, uh, petroleum and natural gas. Um, yet it's poor people in the South who are going to bear more of the costs. Um, on the other hand, there could be something about climate change which says everyone is going to suffer and that uh, even, uh, even rich people will suffer. Um, that hasn't generally been the case. So, you know, in the, there were other forms of pollution in the Industrial Revolution, for example, cities were clogged with the smoke from uh, coal burning. And what did wealthy people do? They built their home up on the hill above the smog. Uh, while the workers uh, toiled and lived in the smog. Uh, so that that inequality is uh, important. It may be that wealthy people can still protect themselves against climate change with um, air conditioning and finding other ways to uh, try and protect themselves directly anyway uh, against the impacts. And private companies may be able to find a way to continue to do their business even as their business um, degrades the environment. So uh, I think it's an open question, and, I, and this is a genuine question. Uh, is the, the problem of climate change and environmental degradation truly a fundamental threat to the ability of the economy to continue to function in a, in a capitalist uh, way of doing things? And are rich people also threatened by climate change? Um, or is it, uh, is it going to be something else? If it, if it was, if we were all in this together, then we, I think, would have better chances of marshalling um, uh, marshalling opinion and marshalling policy to try and solve the problem. On the other hand, if there's people who actually think I can do just fine, climate change or no climate change, then it's going to be more of a struggle within society to say, yes, this is a problem and we have to do something about it. And I honestly don't know the answer, so I'm going to ask you for the answer. What is, uh, what is your view? Uh, let's use the Q&A for just a quick little uh, interruption from the lecture here. Use the Q&A and put your answer in. Do you think capitalists will suffer from climate change and hence will want to stop it? Uh, or do you think that uh, there are those who have got a vested interest in how it's going and think that it will indeed allow them to continue to profit from the way things uh, are happening? The answer could very well be both. So take a moment and uh, put your answers uh, in the Q&A. And uh, I will just uh, call up my Q&A here and see if I can get some uh, answers or some good questions and good comments, by the way, uh, here. Everyone will suffer on some level, but not equally. Financially, there's an opportunity for green capitalists to succeed. Well put, Brennan, you're quite right. There are some capitalists who will see an uh, opportunity for profit in the, uh, uh, in the transition to renewable uh, energy. Capitalists won't suffer until the environment gets to a state where they no longer profit. Uh, so this is interesting. When would they actually stop profiting? Uh, just because people are suffering, and they are, doesn't mean uh, businesses aren't profiting. So that, I think, is a, is a very wise point. Um, it depends on what governments do to incentivize 
changes in behavior by capitalists and businesses and the rich people who own businesses like a carbon tax. Good point. Uh, someone's unequivocal here. No. And someone else is unequivocal. No, not until they're forced. It's a moral question. Some will suffer, others not. I think that's exactly right, Susan. Governments need to make the capitalists suffer financially in order for them to care and take action. You know, and a carbon tax that we'll talk about in a minute is one way to do that. Uh, for companies that uh, that use a lot of energy, suddenly they've got a uh, an interest in trying to get to renewable energy. I'm 80, I'll be fine, but my grandchildren, maybe not. And this is uh, obviously a big generational uh, aspect. Capitalists will be impacted by violent uprisings, as will the rest of us. So this is interesting, Maura. Your point here, I think, is getting at something really, really crucial. It isn't the environment per se that's going to change how we do things. It's our collective reactions to the environmental consequences that we face that will change things. And this is, this is, uh, I, I agree with this entirely. Uh, the system is not going to stop or collapse or hit an environmental wall of its own accord. What is going to change things is people standing up and saying, this is intolerable. We can't do it anymore. And then through uh, political uh, mechanisms and other ways, um, finding ways to stop the worst. So uh, those were great answers, by the way. This is, uh, this is great. I love this collective mind thing that we get going with our question every week. So thank you. Okay, I want to talk about the issue of economic growth and the extent to which it is or is not uh, the problem. Remember, uh, as I've said, ad nauseum, the economy is the sum total of the work that we do to produce goods and services to meet human needs. So economic growth literally means more work and then more output from that growth, more goods and services uh, produced uh, from that. So we often hear in shorthand that the problem is economic growth, but let's decompose that a little bit and think about what are we, what are we actually saying? If growth is the sum total of our work, is it true that more work doing more work is necessarily bad for the uh, environment. And obviously it depends what kind of work. It depends what we're doing and what we're producing and how we're working and how we're producing. Uh, you can have economic growth, the greater value uh, of goods and services produced through our work through all kinds of different channels. You can just produce more stuff, okay? More quantity of everything. That's one form of growth and that has clear environmental implications, I think, or you can produce better stuff. You can keep producing the same stuff, but do higher value so that you get a very nice piece of furniture that lasts for more than a year, rather than uh, something cheap uh, from Ikea. Uh, that's a form of economic growth. Uh, you can drive uh, uh, um, a luxury electric vehicle that costs four times as much as a, a compact conventional vehicle same size of vehicle and probably roughly the same amount of stuff embedded in it, but four times the value added. So are we doing more quantity or are we doing more quality? Are we producing goods or are we producing services? Services also have material inputs. We've talked about this, uh, but they're not as materials intensive as goods production. And if we were shifting more to paying for childcare, say, and healthcare, and even private services like recreation and arts, rather than more stuff that you buy at the dollar store, well, that's a different channel for growth and um, uh, with very different uh, implications for the environment. You can have what's called intensive growth or extensive growth. The best example here is uh, farming. You can have a farm. If you double the size of the farm, you'll produce twice as much stuff, okay? Obvious environmental implications. If on the other hand, you kept the same amount of land, but used it more intensively with different techniques uh, to boost production, you could produce twice as much food from the same amount of land. Intensive growth, uh, potentially with uh, uh, less significant environmental uh, consequences. So um, I work with a great uh, colleague in my work in Australia. Um, his name is Richard Dennis. Dennis with two N's and two S's. If you wanna Google him, you should check out his stuff, Richard Dennis. He's got great videos and commentaries and, and so on. Uh, anyways, uh, he always says, uh, it's not the size of the economy that matters, it's the shape of the economy. And I just think that's really a helpful way to look at it because it depends what we're doing with it. How are we producing? What are we producing? And what do we do with what we produce? And uh, for all those reasons, I'm very skeptical of the argument that growth is the problem and that we have to achieve a no growth economy in order to protect the environment. This is the obvious implication of believing that growth is a problem. And we do hear a call from some 
sectors of the environmental movement and, and other places that we have to stop growth and that's what will save the environment and i'm skeptical that that's either necessary or uh, desirable or even possible there's a lot of work that we have to do okay i think there's a lot of jobs that need to be done and there's a lot of canadians about three million who are unemployed and underemployed who would like to work more so uh, there's a lot to be done and a lot of people to do it and there's lots of things that we could put people to work doing that are not bad for the environment emphasizing quality instead of quantity for example or putting more work into caring services like child care education health care aged care community projects guess what those all count in gdp even uh let alone in terms of a better broader measure of uh economic uh, output and they don't harm the environment by the way there's lots of jobs that help the environment if you put people to work cleaning up a pollution site you're contributing to economic growth you're going to pay them and that's going to add to gdp especially if you put them to work uh you know rolling out renewable energy systems or building transit uh you're also doing something that's good for the environment and creates work and income uh so i think it's uh both economically and politically misguided to blame economic growth for the problem. If we actually did get to a zero growth economy, we stopped a growing GDP, uh, there's a couple of things that are, that are gonna happen. Number one, you've got ongoing productivity growth in the economy uh, because of technology and innovation. So if the amount of output has stopped, okay, you've got a box that's your total amount of output and productivity is growing, that means you've got less work for people every year uh, the total amount of employment would decline every year and uh, even though canada's population is still growing uh, so uh, that's going to be a problem the one way you could manage it would be through very active measures to reduce working hours so that the resulting disemployment was shared equally across society in the form of a shorter and shorter and shorter work week um, but the total amount of output would not grow again and I don't think that's necessary. And in fact, I think it's suboptimal because I think there's things we should be doing. Um, uh, I think the challenge here is recognizing that the way that we organize the economy right now, where most production is undertaken by private for-profit companies who do it in order to make a profit. That's why they're producing it. And they will choose methods of production that maximize their profit. And they will find ways to reduce their costs, including shifting the costs to someone else in economic terms that's called externalize the costs so pollution is a way of externalizing a cost pollution is not free pollution is costly we all we if you have to breathe polluted air we're all paying for that but it isn't borne by the company that polluted it if they're allowed to just dump their waste into the atmosphere as in most cases they are uh, so the challenge here is not stopping work okay uh, the challenge is working differently and putting in place measures uh, that um, um, prevent the kinds of activity that are high polluting and push uh, companies and the economy as a whole to do uh, more stuff that's beneficial. Uh, if you have a copy of Economics for Everyone, there's a, a summary of this on page uh, 206. And uh that sort of categorizes work into these different categories what i would call benign work quality instead of quantity human services uh that are are it's not that they have an invisible environmental footprint you know if you have a school or a hospital in particular you have to be very careful about uh, the environmental effects of that work but the impact on the environment is uh, is quite small You've got lots of forms of work that are good for the environment. So you're growing the economy and protecting the environment or improving the environment in one fell swoop. And then you do have the opportunity of reducing working time uh, over time. And I think this is important and it's kind of fallen off the agenda uh, in most capitalist countries, including Canada, over the period of neoliberalism that we've been talking about back to the late 70s, early 80s uh, for decades. There was almost an expectation that the work week was going to get shorter over time. We used to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week in the Industrial Revolution. Then we got down to six days a week. Then, you know, even in my own parents' uh, work lives, we got to a full weekend. We didn't necessarily have a full weekend until the 60s and early 70s. And then it kind of stopped. You know, the idea of a normal work week is kind of still 40 hours. There's a lot of people working part time and a lot of people working insecure jobs, so they get less hours. But the idea of a standard work week hasn't changed much in the last generation and that's because employers 
by and large don't want it uh, to change, not for full-time workers. So uh, an, a way to uh, reconcile ongoing uh, growth and productivity growth in particular with the environmental protection would be to have um, reductions in working hours as you go forward. I tend to think most people are going to want both over time. A rising standard of living, okay, which means economic growth, and shorter work time, which means more time to enjoy uh, the benefits of a rising standard of living. Uh, so in this case, uh, you know, this degrowth versus managed growth uh, approach, you kind of have two, uh, two uh, opportunities. You can reduce pollution by reducing how much you're doing. That's going to mean less work, less employment, lower incomes, and I think is politically unsellable. Uh, or you can reduce pollution by doing more, uh, expanding investment and work and production in so-called green uh, industries, create more jobs, invest in things like renewable energy and public transit and energy efficient housing, and regulate uh, the other activities in the economy to limit how much pollution occurs. This is the idea, this option two is the idea behind the, the call that you may have heard for a Green New Deal. Uh, that's come from many countries and many in Canada advocating the same thing. The idea of uh, a very ambitious strategy to get more investment, including a lot more public investment in environmental projects and uh, find ways to share the benefits of it. That's the New Deal part of it. Harkening back to the New Deal, the original New Deal is associated with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, and the US government in the 1930s when they uh, responded to the depression by implementing all kinds of new public works and measures to share the wealth more equally. Uh, we'd, we would do that again, but with a strong environmental focus. That's the idea uh, of the Green New Deal. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the pandemic, COVID, and what that has done for all the debates around uh, environment and the economy. I think to some extent it, it, it is gonna to prove to be a turning point, although uh, I did notice this week, the new data on global emissions came out and the sort of temporary decline in global emissions that uh, was experienced in the early days of the pandemic has now been reversed and we're now polluting as much as we ever were. So who knows? Uh, I think it, it still may be a, a turning point, at least in, in consciousness and in policy. Um, we did see a decline in energy demand because of that worldwide recession. You saw some incredible developments in world oil markets including a period of time in, in uh, spring of 2020 when the oil price was negative. That's, that's a bizarre thing. Uh, and it, re it relates to the fact that there's uh, lots of um, uh, financial speculation around oil prices, um, including a whole thing that's called the futures market, where people don't buy oil, they buy a piece of paper that says, I will buy oil in the future. And um, they do it in order to try and profit from the ups and downs of the oil price. It's a kind of gambling, basically. But uh, because of the way oil futures work, uh, there was a period of time where people who were holding that piece of paper saying, I'm going to take the oil, had to pay someone else to take the paper off their hands. And so the oil price for a while was actually negative. Also, you're seeing just the incredible changes in renewable energy uh, that are uh, making it now clearly the cheapest option for future energy development not uh, just for its cleanliness, but because of its uh, cost competitiveness. Uh, and you've seen changes in politics uh, as a result. Um, you know, uh, you obviously saw the US election where there was a clear choice between uh, a candidate who was in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry and a candidate who was committed to some kind of a Green New Deal and, and Biden won. Now, American politics is a swamp. So how long he's going to stay there and how much he's going to get done in the meantime is an open question. But clearly in America, there's a shift in opinion. In Canada, there's been a shift in opinion. I mentioned in the federal election, uh, all the parties except for Maxime Bernier's People's Party, all the parties had relatively ambitious climate change uh, policies. And you can pick and choose between them for sure. But just a huge change in where the goalposts are uh, in this and our government and most around the world have committed to trying to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, so I think it's a bit of a turning point. Here's uh, the thing that shows the uh, big, big, big decline in the uh, price of oil. That's a monthly average. So it's uh, uh, in the first days of the pandemic, the world price of oil fell dramatically. Now it's back up. It's actually back up a little higher than it was in the pandemic yet um, for various reasons, including supply chain concerns and, uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, who knows, but uh, certainly uh, a, 
uh, indication that you can't trust the, the price of oil as the source of your future prosperity. I hope Jason Kenny is listening. Uh, this is a, an interesting thing. This is a study of, by Bloomberg, um, New Energy Finance, uh, uh, who look at the cost of different sources of energy uh, from their headquarters in New York because they're advising people who are investing in this as to where the big potential is. And uh, look over here. These are the cost. Uh, this is for electricity. Uh, the full cycle cost of uh, building a new facility and running it and generating electricity way 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 cheaper now to do it through renewable energy uh, method, uh, methods including solar power uh, wind offshore wind isn't even on this graph but offshore wind is a huge uh, even more cost efficient method for generating uh, electricity and uh, the technology of batteries and transmission and pumped hydro and so on uh, has improved uh, dramatically. So um, there, even in transportation, this is a cost, uh, this is a European study, so it's in euros, the cost of running an electric vehicle, including buying the vehicle uh, and then paying almost nothing for the energy, uh, substantially cheaper than the cost of running a conventional um, gasoline or, or diesel powered vehicle. The problem there is, of course, the electric vehicle is more expensive to buy in the first place and way, way, way cheaper to operate over its lifetime. So uh, how do you get people to shell out that money in the first place? This is the challenge, and this is why governments have tended to subsidize the upfront purchase of electric vehicles. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about markets and prices and uh, tackling climate change and other forms uh, of uh, pollution. Um, the kind of, you know, I've taken a few shots over this course at the kind of conventional uh, mainstream economic theories, uh, what we call neoclassical economic theory, which uh, views everything in terms of supply and demand and efficient markets. And even they acknowledge that pollution is a case of what's called market failure. Because a company is allowed to pollute, they're dumping the cost on the rest of us instead of internalizing the cost. And as a result of that, they uh, make less effective and efficient decisions and they do more pollution than, than they would if they had to actually recognize the cost of pollution. So the approach uh, in this model is to say, well, we should fix that market failure. Instead of coming in with a government edict and a regulation and a kind of central planning approach that says you can't pollute or you have to cut back your pollution, what we'll do is we'll send a market signal instead that will encourage uh, companies to do less uh, pollution because they'll have to recognize the, the, uh, the cost of it. So this is the theory behind uh, different models of putting a price on carbon, as it's been called. Uh, the most obvious and direct one is to have a carbon tax, which is a tax that um, you pay if you're emitting a certain amount of carbon through either production or consumption. And what this involves is um, applying something like a sales tax, but uh, that varies according to how much carbon is in different products. Uh, so your price of gasoline would go up by an amount that reflected the amount of carbon that's emitted when you burn a liter of gas by driving your car and so on and so forth for other things that have carbon in them. Now this has been implemented in uh, several provinces uh, in Canada. Another approach to it is even more sort of market, uh, market friendly is what's called an emissions trading system where the government says we will establish a quota for how much pollution we think is acceptable and then we will allocate permits that allow different people to pollute within the ceiling of that quota, and they can buy and sell the permits from each other. Uh, and there will be a price on those permits, and that's another way of ensuring that, uh, in a way, you're getting the low-hanging fruit first. This is the logic of a, a carbon tax or especially an emissions trading system. Uh, Quebec has an emissions trading system, and uh, Europe has one. California has one. Uh, the idea is uh, who will pay for the permits, the people for whom polluting, redu reducing pollution is the hardest and most expensive. And everyone who's got an easy way to reduce their pollution will, will be able to do it. And this is more economically uh, efficient. So that's the theory uh, of using a market price to drive uh, emissions reduction. I believe that these can help. I, I don't like the emissions trading system in part because I think it's, um, uh, it's very indirect. It's in a way giving people a license to pollute and it's subject to a lot of the same kind of problems around speculation and manipulation that you see in other financial markets. Uh, 
an emissions trading permit in essence would become like a financial asset and we'd have some of the same things happening that you have in stock markets and bond markets and derivatives markets etc all the things that we're going to talk about in the next uh, session um, not next week remember no class next week but the week after on finance uh, carbon tax is more more direct uh, i think these things can help not least because they they raise a source of revenue and the money that comes from a carbon tax could be used as a way of um, uh, financing some of the investments that could be part of a Green New Deal strategy. But I also think you can't just trust a market, even a market with a, a so-called corrected price on pollution. Uh, you have to have some direct limits and regulations on uh, what uh, companies are allowed to do. Uh, and that includes fuel efficiency or energy efficiency rules so that automakers have to hit certain fuel efficiency standards or have to have a certain share of electric vehicles in their total sales, so that houses have to have certain insulation requirements, et cetera. Those are all ways of directly regulating pollution rather than saying, we'll leave it up to the market. And I think those are uh, equally important. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, in the last few minutes about some work that we've done through our center uh, on the impact of the phase out of fossil fuels in Canada's uh, economy and what it's gonna mean for our uh, labor market in particular and employment. Um, there's a lot of mythology again, uh, propagated by the Alberta War Room and uh, the Canadian Petroleum Association and other, uh, other organizations with a vested interest arguing that Canada's economy is totally dependent on fossil fuel extraction and if we try to stop it, will uh, will destroy the engine of our economy. And again, it's just factually false. Uh, we catalog the total uh, number of people in Canada working directly in fossil fuel industries, extraction, distribution, transportation, refining, et cetera. It's less than 1% of uh, total employment in Canada and the share has been declining because uh, fossil fuels have been declining uh, as a share of total energy. Um, there are indirect jobs that also depend on fossil fuels. You could argue even the Tim Hortons workers in Fort McMurray, Alberta, depend on fossil fuel industries because they need employed oil workers to come and buy their coffee. And that is certainly true. But that is true of any industry. Uh, wherever you go in Canada, the Tim Hortons workers depend on people having jobs so that they can go and buy coffee. So the, the issue here is not just to get rid of fossil fuel industries, it's to replace it with something else. And the people working in that something else are gonna go buy coffee, I can assure you. Uh, and that way the indirect uh, jobs will, uh, will still be there. Uh, the key challenge in Canada's case is um, uh, the regional distribution of fossil fuel work and the fact that fossil fuel jobs are concentrated in places where fossil fuels are. That is why I went to university for 10 years to get a PhD so that I could say an amazing thing like that. Fossil fuel jobs are located where the fossil fuels are. And, and that's part of our, our problem, as we'll talk about politically more than economically. Um, so this is the different categories of fossil fuel workers uh, in Canada in 2019. We used the last year before the pandemic uh, under 1%, and that share had declined a lot in the previous five years uh, by uh, really about a quarter, uh, the share of total employment and direct fossil fuel production had declined by a quarter in those five years. There's a, here's a graph, it fell further during COVID, it's now below 0.9% uh, of total employment. And that line, interestingly enough, that line, if you projected it forward, uh, would be consistent with the full phase out of fossil fuel work by 2040, let alone 2050, uh, which is when we're committed to net zero. So uh, the decline in fossil fuel employment is substantial and it is happening. This again is where this idea that somehow you know, we're going to tilt at windmills and try to defend fossil fuels, even though the rest of the world is uh, moving quickly to an, a non-carbon energy system, is absolutely fruitless. Uh, you know, I often say uh, Canada used to export beaver pelts, okay, in our early history. We don't export beaver pelts anymore, and it's not because we ran out of beavers, okay? In fact, if you've ever had a piece of land with a beaver on it, my my mother had a piece of land in, uh, in central Alberta that had a beaver on it. Believe me, you can't get rid of the damn thing. We did not run out of beavers. People stopped buying the beaver pelts for obvious reasons. They found better things to make hats out of. And people are gonna stop buying our fossil fuels because they found better things to generate energy out of. 
And uh, pretending this isn't happening isn't helping anyone. It certainly isn't helping workers in oil industry and other fossil fuel industries who have lost their jobs and lost them without any kind of support. This is the regional concentration issue across the country, uh, less than well under 1% of jobs in direct fossil fuels, but in Alberta, 7.5%. So it's a, a much bigger challenge there. Saskatchewan, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, also uh, significant concentrations because that's where the fossil fuels are. Uh, we also broke the data down according to communities and uh, we identified actually a surprisingly small number of communities where uh, fossil fuels were really important as in over the five percent of uh, total employment so uh, this shows the the map of the different census community areas in canada and which ones have very little fossil fuel employment and which ones have a lot there's 18 only 18 communities now, you know, uh, actually one of them is Calgary, so I, I can't say that they're all small communities. Calgary is a big city uh, with about 8% uh, of jobs directly in fossil fuels. But uh, other places, uh, uh, the number of communities that have to be supported through this transition, and they should be, is relatively small, which means that the, the problem is potentially uh, manageable. Uh, compared to other industries uh, in the economy, uh, fossil fuels, uh, totally employ uh, in 2019 about 160,000. See how that compares to the other major employers in Canada's economy, health and social services is the biggest sector, uh, but all kinds of industries, uh, professional science jobs growing quickly, construction jobs growing quickly. Uh, on average, uh, the largest of these top 10 employ eight times as many people as the fossil fuel industry. So even in Alberta, I've been arguing, Alberta, is it a fossil fuel dependent economy? Yes, in some ways. Guess what? It's more dependent on healthcare. There are more Albertans who work in healthcare than work in fossil fuels. So I like to describe Alberta. I was born in Alberta, by the way, and raised there. So I'm not Alberta bashing. I'm very patriotic to Alberta, but a different vision of Alberta than Jason Kenney. Uh, Alberta is a healthcare dependent economy, is what it is. And we've got to put more energy and resources, and we should have a war room, really, in Alberta to promote healthcare. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that labor markets and employment patterns are always changing all the time. And there's no nothing static there. And we've had huge transitions and transformations in employment in the past with industries that rose and industries that fell. Some of those transitions were much larger than the transition away from fossil fuels. And how does it happen? Well, it happens because people change and people go through their lives and uh, and they learn and they move and they retire. In fact, the retirement piece of it is gonna be the biggest uh, engine of transition going. Fossil fuel workers on average are a little bit older than the typical Canadian worker. Um, most of them are gonna retire in the next 20 years. And uh, just the ongoing churn, if you like, of people who retire, but also leave their jobs for other reasons. Uh, in, tip, in, in, in general, about 20% of the workforce turns over in fossil fuels in a given year. And it's not unusual. That happens in most sectors of the economy. So. If you start with an initial level of employment, say 100 people in year one, and you're even losing 10% of them a year, uh, then you're, you've solved most of the problem over a 20 or 25 year prob uh, uh, 20 or 25 year timeline. And that's why it's possible to imagine the phase out of fossil fuels in Canada if it was supported well and people were encouraged to retire and we didn't backfill their positions with young people who we tricked into coming to work in an industry that has no future, uh, we could absolutely manage this transition without huge dislocation. Uh, I've argued, I've estimated about 8,000 jobs in fossil fuels a year uh, would be phased out to get to zero in 20 years. And yet that's ahead of our 2050 net zero thing. That's the same number of jobs the economy usually produces somewhere in every 10 days. Uh, more than half of that would happen through retirement. So the problem of actually helping someone into another job is, uh, is very manageable, uh, less than 4,000 a year over a 20 year period, you could give them a huge package uh, for a relatively small uh, amount of fiscal support. A billion dollars a year would support 4,000 people to retire, to have, take voluntary severance, to move if they wanted to move back home, you know, to Atlantic Canada, if they happened to, to move from there to Alberta when it was growing. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Lots that you could do for actually a tiny portion of the total cost. The cost of the capital investments in this energy transition are gonna be enormous, hundreds of billions of dollars. One billion a year to take care of the workers, uh, not a lot in my, in my books. 
Uh, okay, well, I am pretty well out of time here, so I'm going to zoom through the last uh, bit of it. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll do a little conclude here. Uh, I do not think, uh, as I've argued, that growth, uh, it, economic growth is the problem. I think that we have to have uh, economic growth measured correctly as doing more work to do the stuff that we need. Uh, but we have to reorient and manage growth so that we're not just producing stuff because it's profitable and we're not producing it in the way that's most profitable for the private companies. Instead, we're doing the stuff that we need and we're doing it in ways that respect the fact that our lives depend on the environment as well as on our, our output. And something like a Green New Deal with a big boost in uh, environmentally motivated investment, public and private, and lots and lots of new jobs, rolling out renewable energy, building transit, uh, building parks, uh, remediating old uh, sites like abandoned oil wells that are still leaking methane. Um, actually, I guess it's the gas wells that are leaking methane. The oil wells are leaking something and um, uh, investing in the production of goods and services like human and caring services that are environmentally benign. That's a way to get more work and a better environment uh, at the same time. So I'm optimistic on that front. It's possible, let me put it that way, but we have to win it. <laughs>